So my name is Kyle DeVigi. I am with Remax Wealth Builders, and we have sold over a thousand pre-construction properties in Calgary over about the last three and a half years. I am a registered broker. I am licensed in Alberta, and my brand is Condo Millionaire. I want to help you build value through real estate, generational wealth over the long term. And my partner, Nish, is on the call as well, also an agent at Remax Wealth Builders. Nish, you want to say a few words? Absolutely. So welcome, everyone. My name is Nish. I own uh, NicheWealthBuilders.com. And like Kyle, really excited about the Calgary market. We're both licensed in Ontario and Alberta as realtors. So we are definitely really excited to be on this call Personally, on my end, I own property out in Alberta that is already tenanted, a couple that will be in the downtown core, which is, I know, an ideal place to do short-term rentals. I'm sure other areas are as well. So looking to learn from the experts, and we will chime in as we need. Great. Thank you. And joining us today, we have Duncan and Beth Haldane, founders and chief operators of YourKey.ca who are the premier short-term rental company in Calgary for nearly a decade now. They are a super host on Airbnb with nearly 4,400 reviews. And this blows me away, a 4.88 star rating. And being in you know, customer service, that is nearly impossible to achieve. So well done. <laughs> yeah, that, that is incredible. Um, you've been featured in the Globe and Mail and... We've been working together now for about nearly two years, and Henley, one of my clients on the session today, actually introduced me to the amazing services that you had going. So welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Perfect. Thanks for that introduction. I don't even know if I can say any more about myself. I think you've covered it all, but my name is Duncan Haldane. I'm the CEO of Your Key Rental Management. I'm here with Beth. We have enjoyed this business for, yeah, going on a decade now, learned a tremendous amount, and frankly, just excited to share more with you today. But I'll let Beth introduce herself now. Yeah, thank you so much for including us and the warm welcome. I oversee all of our day-to-day -day operations at our office. So we have a team of about 25. We just opened a facility here in Calgary. So our own laundry mat, we've got a few vehicles. We really have everything we need to make sure that we're here to care for all of our clients' homes. And yeah, as you guys mentioned, we've kind of grown up with the short-term rental industry, it feels like. So we've kind of been through it all where it started, where it was like people sharing couches and then to the level it is now where it's extremely competitive. So it's it's been a fun journey and we're excited to continue that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I have seen Airbnb and short-term rentals really mature over the last 10 years. I remember going into the first ones and you had locked cabinets because those were people's homes sort of thing. And, and now, you know, that, that's definitely evolved. So one of the most common questions that I get every single day is how can I take advantage of short-term rentals to maximize my real estate portfolio? And is it the right fit for me? So I know you guys can talk more about the opportunity that Airbnb and short-term rentals can provide. Yes, no, for sure. I think we'll cover a lot of that here today. Short-term rentals are a great way to diversify and test out. There's a lot of more benefits than just the return on investment. But of course, for me, when I talk to people, you, as soon as you check the return on investment box, then you realize the suite of other benefits that come along with it, which we'll talk, talk about in our presentation. It is just, uh, it's just phenomenal. Awesome. So why don't we jump into the presentation now then, Duncan? Because I know you guys have some great Perfect. material prepared. We, we do. And, and as we go through, feel free to jump in and ask questions for us. It is, it is more about the dialogue and, and going where the energy goes. But uh, we can definitely jump into our presentation. Perfect. So we can just start off for, um, with what a short-term rental is. Obviously, we've already touched on it. It's uh, Airbnbs and Verbos, uh, but the city of Calgary defines a short-term rental as the business of providing accommodation for anything under 30 days in a home or a portion of a home. This yeah. does differ from the government of Alberta, which deems a short-term rental as anything less than 28 days, which is just important for your taxes. Yeah, so there is a little bit of varying in terms of interpretation, but generally speaking, we, we say anything less than a month, and that's for the city of Ottawa as well. 
And then we were just kind of hitting on this, the benefits of short-term rentals. Yeah, so when we look at this again, the return on investment is typically the first box that we look to check. And in most cases, not always, your return on your investment over a 12 month period here in Calgary, because it is, is cyclical, will be greater than long-term rentals. Now, that again, not in every case, but, but in most cases. A lot of the our clients also benefit from being able to use their property. So if you have a long-term tenant, you can't ask them if you can borrow the condo for the weekend, but when you have a short-term rental, you can book yourself in or your family or friends as a guest and enjoy your property whenever you'd like to. Another big perk is that guests are not tenants, so they're not governed by the Tenancy Act. This really helps um, if there are any incidences. So for example, if they're causing a nuisance or they have broken one of the things in your agreement, such as bringing a pet, you're able to end that stay right away without a rigorous process. Yeah, and we can look at dynamic pricing. I think that just goes into more of our strategy. We use pricing algorithms are constantly fine tuned. But for peak, see, peak time of year, everyone knows the Calgary Stampede. That is absolutely imperative. And when you compare that to long term rentals, you can't toggle up the rent for, for the 10 days of Stampede and, and bring it back down. So short term rentals really allow you to capture that premium especially during the summer months. Now, if we look at home security, and maybe I'll, I'll let that touch on the security options that we provide. Yeah, so again, along the lines of guests not being tenants, you're also allowed to monitor things a lot more. So we install a doorbell camera, so you really see who's coming and going and what's going on at your property. You're also able to install other smart home devices such as noise sensors. So these don't record audio or invade privacy in any way, but they do give you a decibel reading. So you can kind of see and make sure that the guests are respecting your neighbors and your home. They're all just data points. So you don't, you're not, you're, they're still getting them respect and privacy, but you're really protecting your asset and your reputation. Yeah, maybe I'll give a, a quick example of what this actually looks like in practice, just to give uh, people an idea of what this does look like when, when we come and, and manage a property. So this noise sensor, you can set the decibel level threshold. So as soon as that threshold is breached, our team is notified and then we're able to assess the situation. Did it go, you know, just through the, the threshold slightly and it's kind of, you know, wobbling around or did it blow right through and it's absolutely, you can tell it's loud in there and we need to then take the necessary actions for us. This allows us to be proactive. For me, you get that data, you can assess what to do because in condo buildings, you have a license to operate and that can be withdrawn based on certain nuisances that would occur. And for us, we're able to then be proactive, mitigate any nuisance and then continue to operate as, as we need to. Another benefit quickly is also um, the average length of stay currently is around five days. So if you had someone managing your home as a short-term rental, you have a team in there making sure that minor maintenance is taken care of, that there's no damage, changing furnace filters, and really keeping on top of cleaning and other things. So again, just protecting that investment. Yeah, there, there's more benefits than this. We just wanted to pick up the, the top five, and we could probably talk about a, a bunch more, but we'll just leave it here and we'll, we'll, go, uh, we'll go on. And I'm surprised by that five days, <laughs> because normally you think that people are just coming for the weekend sort of thing. So th that's awesome yeah. that you're not having, you know, insane turnover every single day. There's someone there. I think it's just uh, a variety. So we've got a lot of properties that have longer stays and then we've got a lot that are super short. So they just, it averages to five. <laughs> yeah. And then we're always kind of trying to aim to mitigate risk and then that goes to partly what you'll see on this slide is that typically the shorter the stay, the greater the risk. So we're trying to implement higher average lengths of stay. Now, if you host for a shorter period of time, maybe you make a little bit more money, but you increase your incremental risk far outweighs that. So for us, it again is a long-term game. We're not looking at day by day, trying to you know milk the cow as much as we can. We're trying to safeguard that asset and make sure we're taking care of it. Absolutely. So but those longer stays definitely do happen because I know some of my clients have had people stay for, you know, nearly a month sort of thing, which is unreal. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, it is really nice. Um, okay. So I'm sure this is a big question that you guys get. I know that Duncan gets it all the time. What is the best short-term rental property? 
We don't say there's any one best property, but there are a ton of factors that you can consider. Of course, the first being the total investment, so the purchase price, your upkeep, condo fees, furnishing, ongoing management, all of those factors against your cash flow. You can help increase your cash flow by considering uh, unique features or things that are very desirable like gyms, underground parking, beautiful views, or just having a night, enough capacity for a large group. All of those things make you stand out and make your property a better pick against the competition. And like Duncan, go ahead, actually. Yeah, so, and then, I, and then just the risk factor, every property will have their own risk factor. Obviously condos, we primarily, primarily look at the rules and the strength of what their policy is versus homes. Obviously a higher risk that people target homes because they provide more privacy and could potentially uh, result in um, a party, which again, we haven't seen in a long time, knock on wood, because I think the market is shifting away from targeting Airbnbs as a place of opportunity, and it still happens, but really moving in towards that true, true accommodation option. And as Beth said, in terms of the unique features, they don't have to be one of ones. You don't have to have one feature that no one else has. They are just layered onto one another. Underground parking in a Calgary winter plus gym plus, pool plus, view plus, and, and you get the idea here. You're just trying to stack them up together and that gives you the best chance of success. And there's not just one property because if there was one type of property out there that was the best, I think everyone would be doing it. But what we help to do is combine all these factors together in order to give you the best chance of success. And that makes a lot of sense. Like Nish and I were actually just in Calgary and we visited some of uh, Truman's rental product, the Willow it's called on West Calgary. And they had amazing views of the mountains. And I could have sat there all day just looking at that. See, that would do very well. People love beautiful views like that. They're all snow covered in Alberta. Yeah, very pretty. Yeah, a lot of people and do travel here for the, for the mountains. So it is, it's great. Uh, very quickly, Folks, to touch on something you just mentioned. So you talked about the amenities and having access to uh, those types of um, uh, value add components. Those types of elements are also uh, advertised, right? Prominently in, in the listings when they go out. Yeah, okay. You can, exactly. You can filter by those. So it makes like once they start filtering down by the things that they desire, like air conditioning, you'd be surprised how many homes don't have it in Alberta. That makes you rank higher as well. So all those little mm -hmm. things put you up higher. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to have these because, um, I mean, the more boxes you tick, yes, the greater you get down into the funnel. That's, uh, of course, the, the great part of the, the platform. But if you have a property that has had features that you've added to it, typically this is in the furnishing and design space. You can set yourself from the competition from that perspective then you're going to give yourself, again, a greater chance of being booked. And for us, we partner with designers. We'll touch on this later. This is no cost. A lot of what we do to help get our clients up and running, we don't charge for it because we believe we want to make money when you make money. I don't want to make money up front because to me, we're committed in this partnership together. And it can be as small as just a lot of people ignore their outdoor space. So, you know, just making sure that's furnished as well. That still makes you stick out. Yeah, people don't think they think, oh, it's an outdoor patio, it's cold in Calgary all the time. However, yes, that is true for the winter. But in the summertime, when we are in our peak season for short-term rentals, people want that outdoor space. So you want to make that premium if you neglect your outdoor space. That's not going to allow you that opportunity to capture that audience. So that's something to, to consider, even though it is a seasonal market. No, you're, you're absolutely right, especially the barbecue component. That, that is very important to people. Yeah, exactly. You want to enjoy that space. So for, for us, it's great to have those features that get premium in premium months. That's that's always been my focus because those are the months where you, where you make the most money. So it makes sense to spend the most money to invest in those areas. We do have wonderful Chinooks too. I mean, we just had a huge temperature change from last, earlier in the week. So yeah. yeah. Minus 20 yesterday, so we plus 10 on the weekend. Yeah. So it's a radical shift. Let me talk a little bit about the Calgary market. Again, keeping this at a high level, and if there are questions, people want to dive into specific areas, I'm more than happy to take those. AirDNA, it is the largest data provider of short-term rental information globally. 
So I look at this again as a high level to get a, a sense of what the market's doing and how they feel the market is here in Calgary. We have a market score of 75 as of January. I believe this has actually been bumped up to 80, um, but we've cut our data as of January. So looking at the market score, what does that mean? They take into factors such as regulation, rental demand, rental rates. They package it all together and give you a score so you can compare Calgary to, say, a Vancouver or Toronto. Now, of course, where markets where they ban short-term rentals or have significant restrictions, they're going to mark their scores lower. And if you look at Calgary compared to the rest of Canada's major markets, it is one of the best, if not the best, for short-term rentals based on how favorable they are right now to, to uh, regulation. If we look at how many, so how many short-term rentals are here in Calgary? If you actually look at our DNA, it's somewhere just shy of 4,000 entire home listings. This is as of January, about an 18% increase. And believe it or not, that 18% increase year over year is starting to see a little bit of a plateau. Now that we're leveling off out of COVID and starting to get to really what is that true number here in Calgary, if you actually cut that number a little lower, because this number gets a lot of headlines, but if you actually looked at how many listings are full-time Airbnbs, that number is around 1,500 to 2,000. So they're nailing it. That's really what the city has estimated as well. So that is what you look at when making decisions in terms of regulation is what I'll touch on later, but that's your competitive pool. People may flip their unit on for a week for Stampede or two months when they're out traveling or maybe just for a couple of days. Those still register as listings available for rent and that inflates these numbers. Competitiveness, as we talked about a little bit before and you saw the, the lock cabinet or you're sharing a closet with the owner, um, those days are, are really behind us and the pendulum has shifted from heads in beds or a place to sleep to a place where people want to live and have experiences. Maybe it's something different, different than what they're used to in their normal day to day. Maybe they're here on vacation. Again, the competitiveness, the overall services that people expect are more comparable, I would say, to a hotel. And that's the same that they expect from us as a management company is they expect that you'll respond to an inquiry within seconds. And then if they need to, they expect you at that property. And that's where we come in to be able to provide that high quality service. And what would you say the average stay is, Peter? Like, are, are they um, people coming for vacation? Is it for work? W what do you think, Duncan? Can you break that down at all? Yeah, so I will say that there is a steady demographic or demographics that travel all year round. The business travelers, maybe the person that is staying for an insurance event or relocation. There's a lot of those or just, you know, ad hoc, you know, vacations that people take during the year. There's a lot of that travel that is pretty steady, but I will say what creates that massive spike that we do see is the influx of tourists into Calgary and based on the tourism data, data that we're seeing, that's only increasing. Stampede is surprisingly becoming only more popular. Uh, so for us, when tourists come to town, when the weather's warm and people are moving around, that is when you see the big spike, but then you go down to your, your steady demographic. Now that steady demographic is becoming even more popular with more businesses opening up here in Calgary and calling this headquarters, more people looking for, for those temporary accommodations. The movie and film industry is maybe quieted down due to their strike, but now it's starting to, to blow up again. When The Last of Us was here, they took a, a bunch of our units off of our hands and they're paying top dollar. So we evaluate every single opportunity as they come in, if it's better for our clients, we'll pursue that. It doesn't have to be, oh, it has to be a, a week or less, or we want to make sure that our clients are taken care of and we take those opportunities and present them to them. Fantastic. One, one quick follow-up question to that. Um, what do you think the likelihood of businesses, like you mentioned the, the movie industry, but other businesses, especially those that are growing right now in Calgary, they are... It seemed like anyways, that they're doing a lot of in-person events for people that are coming in from out of town. Are you seeing any of those businesses reach out to you to secure these units versus maybe them traditionally going to the hotel sector simply because they want better accommodations for their team members when they're in town? Yeah, this is starting to happen. We're starting to see this a little bit more. 
more as I believe, say, larger companies are becoming more welcoming of short-term rentals and maybe their expense policy doesn't allow it. We're starting to see more companies open that up and we do have companies that come to us and, and maybe it's not for events, but maybe it's housing our workers. Hey, we have four workers, we're gonna put them up in your four bedroom Airbnb versus getting four hotel rooms. So there's an opportunity there that we're looking to tap into, but it does vary for sure. It's encouraging the way the city is growing and the business is growing. It is an, a very uh, lucrative market, I think, worthwhile for everyone to kind of put a bit of energy into. And Duncan, yeah. one of the questions that we're getting a lot in the Q&A is, what do the seasons look like? You know, what are the hot seasons, the cold seasons? Is there huge variability? Can you touch on that a little bit for us? Yeah, so so it is a seasonal market here in, in Calgary. And um, let me start in January. January after Christmas, obviously. I, I say that is probably the slowest time. Hey, it incrementally gets better in February. It gets a little bit better in, in March. So you're starting to see from maybe January to, to March, maybe a 10 or 15% delta. But then you really start to see the increase once you hit May long weekend. That to me is really kind of the, the beginning of when people start to travel. They're hoping it's not snowing, sometimes it is. Uh, but a lot of people are starting to travel and make their travel plans around that May long weekend. And then from there, as, as temperatures increase, you only see your rental rates increase. That's why I always say, the warmer the weather, the warmer the rates. Um, so you continue to see that climb, you peak I'll say in Stampede, I think that is probably obvious. However, the month of August is, there's a tremendous amount of demand in that month. So you don't see a massive drop off. You start to see a curl down into August. And then of course, Labor Day, Thanksgiving, and then you're back down into your, into your valley. So you do see a, a Delta. If you're looking at, again, maybe I'll turn some numbers out there. And this varies based on property, but from January to let's just say Stampede, your lowest rental rate to your highest could be anywhere between three and six times what you're getting in January is what you'll get in Stampede. So that's why it's extremely important to be priced right. That's where our pricing algorithms come in. That's where our over 20,000 nights hosted in the last year. We're able to look at real data. I'm not guessing. I know what properties are renting for. So then we can make sure we're, we're optimizing our properties accordingly. We also get a marketing rep at each of the large uh, platforms that we use because of our number of listings as well. So they give us direct data, including insights into our competition and how to outprice them um, and get bookings before them. Yeah, so people wonder, like, how do you get ranked so high on Airbnb? Well, it's a lot of it, our knowledge in growing that, but like Beth said, we have a dedicated Airbnb rep. And that person meets with us on a monthly basis, tells us what we need to do. And that is something that I will say is a very rare in terms of what management companies see in terms of service from these big platforms. Yeah. And so like Duncan said, uh, with the seasonality, that's where we see uh, with the high prices, we price out all of the people who would like to you know, stay with us for other reasons that keep us afloat during all this the winter months. So the insurance events, business travel, all of those people get priced out of the market by all the tourists. So all summer it's just tourism and then it's everyone else that keeps us going for the rest of the month. Yeah, so, awesome. Um, good insight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I've been other, oh, go ahead. No, no. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, uh, your size and the amount of business that you do. You have some competitive advantages over some of your competitors, especially from the information and data gathering standpoint. One of the questions that we had uh, from our panel or so from, from our attendants were really what sets you apart? I know you briefly touched on it, but maybe providing a few more uh, high level components of what really sets you apart from the other competitors out there that you're working against. We've got a lot of that coming in the next slide. Yeah, we can touch on it maybe oh, right now. But yeah, we, we, we don't like to talk, you know, we don't like to talk about us too much. I think that's just who we are as people. We have a slide later, but we okay. can touch on maybe the one big thing that I think separates us apart from everyone else, not just our experience in the data and our, and our ability to manage the day-to-day, -day, but we are focused in Calgary. We've established the only short-term rental facility in Calgary. And if people are in Calgary, you can come and check it out. What you'll see in that facility is like Beth said, we built a laundromat, industrial washers and dryers, brand new in our facility. Um, and what we're trying to do with this facility is 
reduce our overall costs for our clients and be able to make sure that we are remaining as competitive as possible because the, the lower your expenses, specifically around cleaning, the more money your clients are going to make. So for us, that's our strategic focus. And everyone that works for us is our employee. So from the cleaners to our people who do our customer service, everyone is a, is a your key employee. We don't subcontract these out. We don't outsource to virtual assistants all over the world just to save some money. We believe in Calgary. We are we are only dedicated to this market. So you won't see us looking to target uh, you know somewhere in the United States or somewhere in Mexico. We are we are here. We live here, and that's what makes us uh, special. Uh, that's fantastic. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, appreciate that. And Duncan, there's huge misconception about if short-term rentals are allowed. You know, we see jurisdictions like Ontario and BC that have significantly restricted it. So maybe let's go to the next side and talk about what the city of Calgary and Alberta does in general. Perfect. So prior to January 1st, 2024, they, they made some changes. Prior to that, I described it as a pay for play. You pay the city the $100 business license very little checks and balances, and you got to play. So you got to list your unit as much as you want uh, as a short-term rental, as long as you paid that, that licensing fee. Now that didn't seem like that didn't seem like it was meeting this, the right intent of what the market actually needs to be sustainable. And what we're seeing right now from regulation is I'm actually uh, I'm actually very happy to see this higher quality of standards. We're not getting the fly-by-night people. We're not getting the illegal people hosting in different buildings that they're not supposed to because that condo board now needs to provide a letter of authorization. So the city needs to see that to get in your license. They need to see that you have insurance. They need to see you have proof to uh, rent that property out as a short-term rental because a lot of people would go out there and, and try Airbnb arbitrage. I'm going to rent the property from a from an unsuspecting landlord, and I'm gonna go use it as a short-term rental without their consent. They're taking those actors out of the market, which I think is a very positive thing. And then of course, more fire um, regulation and more, um, there's an emergency exit plan, fire plan. These are just very fundamental things that I believe we can build from, and to me is a positive indication. Yeah, proper insurance, all of these things is getting rid of illegal basement suites, providing a higher standard so that will actually attract more people to the market, like guests, for example, because they can feel safe and know that you're running it professionally. Yeah, sustainability is big. So we don't want the market to rise fast and crash. Right now, it seems like it rose fast. Now we're coming down and we're trying to find where that, where that right balance is. And I'll talk more about what the future looks like on the next slide, although I can't tell the future, but I, I do have some information. Um, but one other fact that I like to raise in this, I get this question all the time, and I'm sure you guys do as well, is I don't see short-term rentals being restricted in my bylaws. doesn't say anything about them. I'm allowed to then short-term rent. Well, that's not actually the case. What happens is short-term rentals are legally considered commercial operations. Now, of course, this is up for debate, depending what lawyer you talk to. But in most recent court uh, rulings, it's considered a commercial operation. If you look into the bylaws, it'll probably say something that you can't use your property as a the condo as a home business. You can't run a business out of your property. And they're considering this more like a commercial operation. So that clause is almost in every set of uh, bylaws that I've ever read. That's why condo boards are so important because then they hold all the cards unless they write short-term rentals into the bylaws, which Often they don't. They create a standalone policy that always has a line saying this can be revoked at basically any time. So that's where the risk comes in. But we look for buildings that have a very strong condo board that is pro short-term rental. And we recommend those to, to our clients. And I think that's something that's key for people to understand is any condo ownership, short-term rentals can be restricted really at any time in the bylaws or allowed in the bylaws as well. It's up to the board of directors to decide what's going in there ultimately. Yes. The good thing is the board of directors is also uh, responsible for answering to the corporation, right? And the corporation is made up of the owners. So the owners have a right. And if you're looking at investment properties, you don't want to handicap yourself in the amount of money that you can make. So to your point, everyone here, you are looking for buildings that are going to have or a corporation that is going to be positively looking at the return that their investors can have on their yeah. investment. 
Yeah, and, and what, what the, the sweet spot is, it allows short-term rentals, but you know, based on market comparable rents, that if it did, for whatever reason, should they change their bylaws on a whim, then you know, hey, I know that this property can earn X amount of dollars as a long-term rental. It hedges your risk. So you're not completely um, up a creek without a paddle. You have an opportunity to then still make a positive investment decision without maybe making as much cash as you were. So again, there's a lot of factors that go into this and we wanna make sure that whatever decision people make, that uh, they have a little bit of a, a fallback plan. And that's also one of the huge values that you guys bring, you know, Duncan and Beth, that you know the buildings where they are short-term rental friendly too. So you can help guide clients towards those. Yeah, we can send those out afterwards as well. You can take a look at them. We know the big, the bigger ones. There's always these, you know, smaller, you know, 10, 20 unit buildings. Um, you know, they, they crop up every once in a while. However, when we do look at, say, the downtown core, we, we do have a very good handle on in terms of what buildings allow and kind of what their condo board is, is looking like. Perfect. So if I'm to look in the future in the crystal ball, uh, this is what I'll see. And right now, the city of Calgary has commissioned the University of Calgary to do a in-depth study in terms of the impact of short-term rentals on the Calgary market specifically. This is to conclude in December 2024. We were actually one of three companies that were able to participate in a focus group with the person and group that is actually conducting the study. So a direct line to hopefully try to influence and advocate for what we believe would be a positive outcome. We're able to talk about not only the positive impacts from an economic perspective, but there are some risks. And I think that with the right regulation, you can mitigate some of that downside and still be able to flourish. Um, so this study will continue to be ongoing. Preliminary information coming out of that is very positive because they are looking at data, not just the high level 4,000 units. And okay, if we bring those 4,000 units back into the market, it's gonna save rental rates here in Calgary. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that probably wanna believe that's the silver bullet. When in actuality, there's been a study done by the Conference Board of Canada. Anyone can Google this, it's, it's public information. And they studied the impact of short-term rentals across Canada's major markets. And when we look at Calgary specifically, of the 30% rent increase over the last say five years, less than 1% of that increase can be attributed to short-term rentals. So when you look at that to me, that doesn't solve anything to do with affordability that people are looking to raise that as an argument. For us, again, we anchor back to data. We look at how many full-time rentals there are, 1,500 rentals in Calgary. That is, that is insignificant to the actual landscape of the amount of rental properties. So for us, we try to get past the headlines and we're trying to influence the way we can. And that's uh, really going to hopefully show through in, in the study. Another headline that we, again, myth busting these things, right? You see these big headlines that catch people's uh, attention and people, hey, they see the headline, they, they scroll through the next article. Well, what we found was the CRA has implemented, say, more restrictions on, on short-term rentals in provinces where they have, where they have created restrictions for short-term rentals. So say, BC, for example, where they've banned short-term rentals and set for you know, tourist communities. For those markets that have implemented those rules, the CRA is limiting or restricting what they can actually write off in terms of their expenses. So trying to influence compliance through hitting them in their pocketbook. Well, in Calgary, if we look here, the crackdown doesn't apply because we have a market that has regulation as long as you follow the rules, then you won't have a problem with the CRA. But it has deterred people from investing here in Calgary. And I've talked to them on the phone and they say, this is too much. I'm scared of the CRA for whatever reason. Um, and, and to me, it's trying to, again, get that right information into the market because the government got what they want. They scare people away from short-term rentals and then they're doing everything that they can. Yeah. And there's huge misconceptions around this. You know, I do encounter it a lot and people do think that that's a blanket um, condition across Canada. 
where no, it's only if you're not following the rules, you're not doing what the municipalities and provinces allow you to do, then the CRA is going to step in. Doesn't apply in Calgary. Exactly. Yeah. And in the in the markets where they have banned short term rental sites, I believe they're it's a different rental market, it's a different set of issues that they're facing. And they like to blanket that oh, Canada everywhere has that has this issue. Well, I don't think that's true. And um, yeah, the CRA is, is definitely trying to make it feel that way. And uh, some people are, are scared, but to me, if, if some people are, are now fearful of the market, this is an opportunity and an opportunity for people to, to get in and see through, through what the headlines are. We'll spend too much time on this slide, but really for us, what, what we wanna talk about here as well is what does this process look like? We understand there's an opportunity for short-term rentals. We understand there's potentially higher rate of return on investment and there's other benefits. Well, for us, what I want to cover now is looking at the opportunity from a uh, process perspective. What does this look like in fundamental if I were to buy a property tomorrow? What does this process and look like? And how we can help you. <laughs> exactly. So again, these are these are I keep it, I keep it at a high level, but at the end of the day, we're looking to win-win. For us, it's not. Um, we want to gain a client at any expense. That's not true. For us, we want to build a very strong, long-lasting reputation. We feel uh, the people that we partner with share that same philosophy because realtors, just like us as a management company, we're looking at the long game. We're building those relationships, and you need to build trust. And as part of that process, it's sometimes people are like, hey, I'll try it out because I don't really know what's going to happen. But once they try it out and get to experience it, for us, what we're hoping for is, hey, I'm going to go buy another property. Great. That's music to our ears. And that is more important to us than, say, the short term, what you can make in, in a few months. And from a process perspective, what this would look like if, if you're working with Kyle or Nish, they would identify, hey, we found this building, potential opportunity. Um, maybe the client says, I want to get involved in short term rentals then we get brought into the conversation. We can help guide that compass based on our um, experience here in the Calgary market. We can help focus what that search looks like based on that individual. Then we go into sourcing, again, looking at different potential properties and then assessing where the opportunities might be. The most important piece to this puzzle that I've found typically is People want to understand what do the dollars and cents really mean for them. That's where the financial projection comes in. I'll touch on it in more detail on the next slide because I believe so fundamentally in this is that what we can create gives you a realistic idea of what you could potentially earn. You can ignore what people out there say, I'm getting rich off short-term rentals overnight and it just seems like I said it and I don't have to do any work. Well, you know, you can believe that, but in actuality, there's a tremendous amount of work to do this at a high level, day in and day out. And I think if that financial hurdle is clear first, then we can continue to uh, go on to the next benefits. The sale process would occur, and once the conditions are lifted, that's a trigger point for us to then begin the property setup process. Now, what I wanna say in here is that we're taking a lot of this burden away from people. So I would say over half of the people that I have met as clients, never have actually met them in person. Um, and we have set their properties up here in Calgary successfully and ran them for many years. That starts with that initial conversation, but moving through to the design process, what does that look like from procurement of furnishings and then shipping those furnishings? Hence, we have a facility. We can have everything shipped here, cataloged, stored, wait for that closing or possession date, and then the day after, we get them all moved to the facility, get them moved to the property, get everything assembled, staged, photographed, video, and, and then we're off and running. But in this process, you don't see that there is really as much client involvement. They can be as involved as they want. A lot of people do want to be involved in the furnishing and design because you own those furnishings. And we, we are very much partnered through that process. We provide advice. We don't necessarily say, you shall do this and you shall do that. If not, we're not working together. No, we very much understand it's your property and we're here to provide that advice and expertise. But as you can see through this entire process, we take a lot of that work on and we don't charge. There's no management fee for this. We don't say, 
it's a two or three thousand dollar setup cost and that's going right into our pocket we spend a tremendous amount of time time is money and for us we're hoping that this is then a long-term relationship and that's where we see the value as a management company yes we value the relationship with the realtor of course which is why we start with offering uh, services there where we can be a partner and offer all of the data and information that we have to assist your client in the hopes of them becoming our client and then equally want to offer them value where we offer the free design um, design plans. We All of the sourcing and procurement of the furnishings is all free of charge as well as same with the storing of it. And then it's just low cost for the move and assembly. And what then, people need to understand as well is this isn't necessarily just for existing properties. We can do this with pre-construction properties as well. And there have been opportunities like Truman Homes even has advertised specifically some of their buildings are short-term rental friendly. So we can yeah. position it, we can get you know clients ready, buy a pre-construction property, and then at closing, you guys can take the keys and run with it. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, Truman is a great example. I'm glad you brought that up. There's a lot of very exciting opportunities that I'm sure you've shared with your clients. But that's exciting for us. Those are things that we're looking at also, you know, advertising to not just ourselves, but our, our clients that are looking for properties as well. Um, but this, you can notice these dots. Yeah, but there's dots on a page. But again, there can be a year or two years between some of these dots. That's not a problem. We still provide that same soul, provide that same support, whether it is the financial projection. Look at a unit, forecast what you think it's going to make. Then you can make your decision. And then there's a, a, a time lapse. That's completely fine with us. We're not charging a fee. We're just hoping that at the end of it, that it then results in a um, property for us to manage. And if it doesn't, hopefully a, a very positive relationship. Yep. And moving on to the operations, we, of course, set up all of the photos and videos and all of the marketing and listings free of charge as well. So all of those smart home technologies, smart locks, cameras, noise sensors, all of those are also provided by us with no charge. Yeah, we lower the barrier to entry as best as we can, taking a lot of the burden on ourselves, which increases our own risk as a company. Uh, but we felt that this has been a, a great approach and allowed us to build some great, great uh, relationships. Fantastic. I think uh, what's really important and what what resonates really well in this in this uh, workshop so far, webinar, is that the majority of our investors want to be hands off as much of a turnkey solution as we can provide them in buying the right investment property. We have that solution and it definitely sounds like your business model mirrors our approach when it comes to our investors. You want to be those uh, partners that we are happy to work with that will provide the same solution for our clients that are looking to use the short-term uh, category to further build their, uh, their wealth through these investments. Yeah, our whole business is focused around trying to make sure that we take the burden off of other people so we can preserve that relationship so that it can continue to flourish and they focus on buying more properties to hand over to us. So even with going into the operations, where we stand out from our competition is a lot of our competition, if, for example, you have a loose toilet seat, you'd see an invoice charge for for example, I've heard exactly like $200 from one of our competition to tighten a toilet seat. You would never see that charge from us. Our team goes and on site does all of these things. Your heat goes out. We dispatch people immediately to bring over heaters if we can't get that figured out right away. Like we make sure that there is very small burden to our clients and try to reduce all costs. And that is included in um, just some of the things that we can that we provide in our management fee, um, I, but we'll touch on that more a little bit later. Yeah, so I think for, for us, we're, we're, although I, I don't want to fall into the, you're a property manager and then there's this negative stigma around it. I feel like what's made us special is that we do things different that Beth has said, I don't charge you hundred dollars to change a light bulb. They burn up over time. You pay for the light bulb, I pay for the labor to go get the light bulb, bring it to the property, install the light bulb. Of course, we take on that cost as well. But again, I would, what our approach is, we're trying to keep the numbers as consistent and understandable as possible. We don't want you to have an invoice at the end of the month where you look at it and wonder, what the heck happened? Why do I got all these additional charges? That's absolutely not what you'll expect from us. And we can dive in and, and again, as people want to discuss our management fee and what we offer, Beth has touched on some of the benefits. 
we're happy to do that later. We're happy to do it in, in a separate call. You can always reach out to us as well. We'll have our contact information here at the end. And again, we're happy to, to share that information with our, with our clients. But Nish, to go back to what you said, for us, it's a, it's a spectrum. People can be as involved or not at all. For us, we can say, here, here's the estimated cost to get it set up. They can say, great, cut the check. You guys get it set up, send me the receipts, and then we're off to the races. That could be an option as well. Typically, we like to be, you know, have that engagement. So they're a little bit more involved. They know what it's going to look and feel. We can ask questions. But again, we can take the entire burden away from people, have limited communication. And I always say, you do what you do well, and let me do what I do well. And then we all end, we're all happy at the end. Aces in their places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, what, what we find is typically, uh, you know, if you have one property, you may want to be more hands on. But as issues pile up or your time requirements start adding up, you can't scale and still continue to do the same things that you could do with just one property because that will become a full time job for you. So to have a solution where you can be as involved or not as involved as you want to be is ideal. Yeah, that's where our operation comes in. Our twenty-five employees. They, there, things happen out of the way, out of the blue. You can have the best set plan. Something can happen. We're here. We respond. We're all local. So I think that's a, a huge benefit. Exactly. Kyle, did you want to jump cool. into some of the questions that we have uh, piled up here? Uh, no, let's do them at the end. I think we're almost done. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I've touched on the financial projection. This is just, a, again, a example of what one would look like. Now, we, these are, these are tailored specifically to the property, to the floor plan, to how many people can sleep. These are very tailored projections. I create them bespoke every single time. Um, and what I want to do is make sure that we are putting on numbers that I believe are achievable. Not, I think you could do this. You know, I think you could really achieve this, but you know, that's more aspirational. I say, these are numbers you, you realistically can do. And if we overachieve them, great. But I want you to be able to make a sound financial decision. And this is based on the over 20,000 nights. That's just in the past 12 months. Of course, data continues to flow. Markets continue to have different trends. But for us, we actually can look at this information and know what does a two bedroom make in this building? Because we have three of them. Great, you can actually understand what that data really means versus a one on Airbnb, this one says 200, this one says 100, that one says 500. Now, okay, I'm gonna guess it's somewhere in the middle. There's no guessing really with us. For us, this is a very customized approach. We wanna be as transparent as possible. That's why this will show every single month, not just the good months, not just the bad months. We do average it out. But it also breaks down all the different costs that would go into that. So again, owners understand what are the line items that are going to be in my pocketbook. And one of the common questions that we're getting is, is it better to do a one bedroom, a two bedroom, a three bedroom? You know, I would say it's very, very situational. And that's where, you know, reach out to Duncan and Beth. You can talk more about um, your investment objectives and what the best fit would be for you. And yeah, they have the data sure. too. Yeah, yeah and they the have data the data yeah, we can talk about different areas and different different areas that would be good for certain types of properties. Again, it does vary on the situation, but for us, we're more than happy to share that information with people. Obviously, one bedroom condo is different than two bedroom condos. If you're looking at a two bedroom townhouse, that differs than a three bedroom townhouse. What I will say is that because we are, we do target a lot of that tourist travel. Is that people don't necessarily know tourists don't necessarily know that Kensington is a very popular neighborhood. You know, it's very walkable. There's lots of restaurants and shops. They know the Calgary Stampede. They might know the Flames. They know 17th Avenue probably. So we again, we have to put ourselves in that type of mindset and not think, oh, Martin Luke's a great area to you know raise a family. Well, if I'm a tourist, I probably don't care about that or know about that. So we have to put ourselves in that mindset because different neighborhoods will put different premiums on different properties. And that might not necessarily make sense from a short-term rental perspective, but it might make sense from a long-term rental perspective. Cool, I'll flip to this next slide. We touched about this a little bit already, but a little bit about what makes us different. If you go on AirDNA.co right now, type in Calgary, you'll see we're the highest rated management company in Calgary. 
we're the largest management company. To me, I don't like to hang our hat on oh, where the, the biggest company that makes us the best. No, for us, we've invested in Calgary. We have the only short-term rental facility. People who, other management companies will manage their property, they'll use your on-site washer and dryer. They'll do four or five loads in a four-hour period. A very short wash, so the sanitation's not there either. There's your utilities, <laughs> there's your electricity. These are incremental costs that yeah, may not sound like a lot, but when your washer and dryer breaks down, that $1,500, $2,000 it takes to replace it, yeah, that does add up and then hits you. For us, we take that. We have our own machines. These are maintained. Very high quality cleans, by the way. I've learned so much about uh, the water flows and chemicals and all different things. But all that to say is we provide, in my mind, the only best-in-class operation here in Calgary. Other companies are still struggling to figure out what does that look like. And maybe they don't have the means to invest. We're, we're, we're investing here in Calgary. That goes with our employees. Our strategic decision is we're locally owned, we're operated here. Everyone's a, a Yorkie employee and they all live here in Calgary. So you're gonna talk to someone. They're, they're sitting right out the door right now and you know answering guest messages, coordin coordinating what that day looks like and making sure that we are providing that consistent operation every single day. Because what I like to say, whether my team likes it or not, is you're only as good as the previous day. You can't hang your hat again on, we did so great yesterday, today we didn't do so good. No, you have to be consistent and that's every single day. And that's part of what makes us special. And by having employees, we have a lot more control over that process. Now we look at, again, I Marriott, a very big hotel company in the world. They started their own arm, uh, Marriott International Homes and Villas. They approached us in 2021 and said, Duncan and Beth, you guys have a great operation. We wanna make you an anchor partner. The first one here in Alberta, what do you think? I thought, wow, is this real? Am I getting, uh, is, it, is this a trick? We actually jumped through the six months of hoops that it took to actually become certified, their brand training, all the other trainings that you need to do. And now we're one of the only people listed on Married Homes and Villas here in Alberta. Very high quality of guest traveler, as you can imagine, someone collecting Bonvoy points. They're not there to trash your property because they don't want to have any negative impact to their reputation. And um, yeah, that, that's a little bit about what makes us special. I think uh, you guys did ask what sets us apart from our competition, and I think maybe just talking a bit more about what's included in our management fee is important. So our management fee is 25%, which is very common across the board. Um, what you don't see is the inclusions that we have. So, of course, we touched on like, the um, design plan and all of those things, but on the day-to-day -day management, our clients don't ever pay for any linen, so guest stain, steel, linens, towels, sheets, all the time. Our clients don't pay for those replacements, we do. Uh, any of the guest consumables, so that's like laundry detergent, uh, soap, shampoo, toilet paper, paper towels, salt, pepper, all of those things, that's also provided by us, no cost to our clients as well. Yeah, what that is explaining is we try to keep everything contained into that and not have those incremental five, 10, 50, 500, $200 charges on your invoice. And again, our, our, our management of the property from a security perspective as well is also included in that. Yeah, and anything related to the guest uh, that we need to do, like if there is an emergency on-site visit, there's no cost to our clients as well. That's just standard operation for us. Great. Knowing what your costs are, a flat rate definitely helps uh, protect yeah, make your it, investment it, dollars. Yeah, okay. it also helps with the relationship. Believe it or not, um, we, we've learned as we went through. And when you have those unpredictable costs, I feel like it deteriorates that relationship slowly over time. And for this, it allows you to say, we know what we're spending, we can manage that. And the client knows, I know what I'm paying in terms of the management fee. Yeah, that's all we had for our presentation. I shouldn't say all we had. I think we've been doing a lot of talking here, but uh, here's our contact information. If people do want to reach out anytime even after this or follow us on social media to see what we're up to, there's always new properties uh, coming out. Uh, but that's how you get a hold of us. Um, if you email, I can respond with my personal number as well, and we can chat further. And, uh, and just we'll before now. we jump in, just before we jumped in into the questions, for any uh, of those that need to leave because you're on your lunch break, this is being recorded, so you will get a full copy with all the Q and A's as well. So 
Uh, don't worry about it if you have to leave, but uh, we will definitely want to take up some of the, well, pretty much all of the questions and we'll get the answers from the professionals. Awesome. So let's jump into the questions then. So Patrick is asking, is it better to lease your pre-construction or do Airbnb? And I would say it is very situational. Some people prefer to do long-term rentals. Some want to maximize their profits and do Airbnb. So if you want to walk through that scenario, give me a call or niche and we can discuss, you know, what makes the most sense for you and your property. Yeah, that's where the, that's where the financial projection comes in that we help provide you and you guys can manage that. And, and uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Annabelle is asking, so do Airbnb still make money with those high condo fees? Yeah, I think condo fees are, yeah, it is an expense to consider. And that's what Beth was mentioning in terms of knowing that full investment cost. And I can say, yes, they do, because we do have a lot of condos, even more people purchasing condos. Um, so it, it, again, looking at what you get for those is also important. Not every building makes sense. There's some that are right out of, out of whack, but there are still some buildings that are pretty reasonable that we like to target. For sure. And I think, I mean, even with a home, you have to consider utilities. So there's always costs everywhere. We also have tourism levy, which is 4%. So that's another cost you have to consider, which again, the projections help because it doesn't always make sense to do a short-term rental. Awesome. Mohammed is asking, is it advisable to list a four bedroom home as one single property or as four single rooms to rent? Yeah, so what, what we look at is, and then the numbers have told us that renting it as one main property is far more advantageous than managing four, say, doors within that property, especially when you look at the prime season, let's say summertime, when people are traveling in groups, maybe families are traveling together, maybe it's one big family, maybe it's friends that just want their own bed, they're going to pay that premium to stay in that place and have access to that or just themselves, especially after COVID, people have been slowly getting back into, hey, you know, I'm comfortable with other people in my space. But I, I would say that private room rentals really took a nosedive and haven't really recovered since COVID. I think you spend a lot of your time mediating things between those residents as well. So that would be something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't imagine managing <laughs> four doors, <laughs> like, and they're sharing yeah. everything. That, that's a nightmare for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially when you don't know each other. Or even yeah. if you do know each other, it's not ideal. Yeah, a lot of people for the shared spaces, they don't actually read it correctly. It doesn't matter how many places you put it. So you'd probably deal with that too. People showing up and being annoyed that there's people in the room they thought was theirs. So, yeah. I guarantee that'll happen. Uh, so Carolyn's asking, how about midterm rentals? So rentals mm -hmm. over 30 days. Do you guys have any comments about that? We have quite a few and they're honestly amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So different buildings that might have say changed their short-term rental policy and say, now we're not allowing it. We've actually had clients that have pivoted to a midterm rental type format, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And they're very happy because they still get some of the benefits if they want to use the property between people. There, there's some benefits there as well. Also, typically the rental rates are higher than when you compare with long-term rental as well. Now you don't get that significant margin because people who are staying for longer understand that they're not there for three days and paying 500 a night. They're looking for a longer, more economical um, rental option. So it is something that we look to do, especially in the slow season. So as we start to see the premium rental rates go down, we will now entertain a lot more midterm rental options to help hedge through that slow season. Yeah, and uh, I think there there is a bigger risk. So there's condos where they only allow uh, stays of 30 or more days. So if that's dictated, then you, have, you do have a higher risk than if you have a gap for two weeks, like you're not able to make up that two weeks of revenue, so. And do you guys do the midterm rentals then for clients as well? Yeah, we do, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, this is a situation that one of my clients actually dealt with here in Toronto. Uh, what happens if uh, the condo board, uh, you know, decides that they're going to stop short-term rentals? How does that impact the business? Is there a grace period? What has your experience been like? Yeah, this, yeah, this has happened to us a few times. Um, and one of the buildings actually that we managed in just did this last week where they were favorable to short-term rentals. 
and they have just changed their mind. So they have given a grace period until the end of December, and then it will shift to 30 plus days. And typically our clients just then shift to midterms and continue to stay with us. Yeah, and what we've found is that it varies in terms of how they are enforcing their rules. We saw another one, I believe it was just over a year and a half ago, changed their rules. And some of our clients said, I don't care. They can find me as much as they want. I'm going to keep doing it until I sell my property. Or some clients were scared and went right to, to midterm rentals right away. So it does vary. Um, it does, again, the condo board is going to be quite specific. But if you did say have reservations that were in the future, you don't get penalized for having to cancel those because you can prove that to Airbnb or the other sites that, hey, I don't have access to this legally, I can't do it. So they'll cancel those free of charge. And sometimes you'll get wind of things and you can sell first. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, I, the other question is uh, in regards to, I think something you already covered, you're, you're focusing on Calgary, you're not really operating in other larger markets outside of Calgary. Um, and I know that uh, many want to get in contact with you, so we will definitely share your contact information uh, as part of the wrap-up, but we'll also send that uh, in our follow-up email to everyone. So we will skip that question because I think we somewhat covered that. Uh, a question from Patrick. Um, oh, okay, I guess it's connected. Do you plan on expanding to, uh, to other provinces or are you going to stick to Calgary in the near future? Yeah, so I would say that right now we're, we operate within, within an hour radius. That's what I like to say, an hour around Calgary, because to me, that's not very far to Toronto. That's a common commute, right? So for here, for us, about an hour radius allows us to capture, you know, some of the surrounding areas, some, some positive markets as well. Right now, we are strictly focused on Calgary. I want to understand the scalability of this, of this business as we continue to scale, make sure that we have a model that can be repl replicated and potentially, yeah, maybe in the future down the line, there is a Yorkie somewhere else. Haven't entertained that as, as a thought right now because we are just focused on making sure that this is a best-in-class operation and that we do this the best and have maybe some positive influence over a market like this that we can then showcase to maybe other markets saying, oh, we're, we're thinking about these rules. Well, hey, we're experts in this. So trying to leverage that expertise where we can. Yeah, we really care about the quality that we provide to our clients and to our guests. So it just doesn't feel as easy in a different market where we can't oversee it as well. You also can't offer the same services. Uh, you're, a lot of our competition will hire um, like contractors and then that those people are not covered under the homeowner, homeowner's insurance, for example. So that's how a lot of the other people do operate in other markets. And so it's a big risk for your clients. Brilliant. Um, in terms of your pricing, and I'm sure you can have these conversations with uh, people that reach out to you directly, but if you have a, a client that is looking to put multiple properties on your platform, is there any benefit to doing so from a financial standpoint, or is it simply the uh, the rate that is offered, 25%? Yeah, so I, I say we're business people at the end of the day. We recognize this is business. Finance is part of that, a big piece of that. We're not shy about talking about it. I say it's a case-by-case -case situation. You provide me value and I'll do as much as I can in return. Again, it's a relationship. Um, for me, if people are just trying to nickel and dime you for the fact that they want to pay less, I don't, I don't believe in that as a business practice. I think it's a two-way street. It always will be. But again, it very much is dependent on the situation. And uh, we can definitely, yeah, have that conversation. Volume obviously is important and equally um, we do have some properties that are upwards of $5 million and of course those nightly rates are quite high and so we do flex there too. Oh, okay, fourteen million dollar properties with its own private golf course if anyone's a big yeah. golfer and wants to come, actually, yeah, uh, that's... come to Calgary. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, not all properties are built the same. So I, I can see yeah. the, the value in offering some options there. Um, how many platforms would your key rental management property be able to be booked through? Hmm. Yeah, so there is, there's a lot of booking platforms out there. Um, part of the reason why I had the Airbnb logo on one of the slides was Calgary is an Airbnb market. You come here, we do 90% of our business through Airbnb, not because we're just marketed through them, but because 80% of all short-term rentals in Calgary are only listed on Airbnb. I believe it's 15% are only listed on VRBO. And then there's a combination in between. So Calgary very much, if you're looking to have the most successful business, you put your most effort where, where it matters. 
that's Airbnb. Next is VRBO. And then we have Marriott because they do offer a better caliber of guests. Now you could probably manage on several other sites. However, there are significant drawbacks because they aren't necessarily short-term rental specific. They could be sites like booking.com where they're predominantly hotels. They don't provide a lot of protection for homeowners if something did go catastrophically wrong. So for us, we primarily focus on these three platforms. Now, if someone had a desire to be hosted on a, another platform for whatever reason, again, we can have that conversation for sure. I don't close the door on that. But from a success perspective, I put time where I see the greatest return. And, and let's say you're not getting the expected level of traffic using the current system you have in place. Do you do you revisit the, the process and, and the placements and try to reevaluate if there's a better method to maybe increase traffic on a particular rental that isn't getting the type of traction that uh, you'd like to see? For sure. This is proactively done. So we don't wait and say, oh, wow, that property really didn't get anyone for the last two months. And we're sitting here thinking, what happened? For us, we're constantly looking at properties' performance. We look at them on a monthly basis with Airbnb alone. But this goes back again to say pricing and your pricing strategy and trying to see well, maybe why isn't this property meeting the benchmark of our other properties? We do that internal analysis and make sure that we can then make recommendations to the, okay. to the homeowner potentially and say, hey, I know you didn't want a sofa bed before, but you know what? Two bedroom, two bathroom units. If you have this, here's the incremental increase you can expect because here's what our other units are doing. Again, making that advice, not saying you have to take it because some people say, no, I don't want to have a sofa bed for whatever reason. Again, that's a personal choice point, but for us, we provide advice. And then um, ideally this is, again, for us, it's an ongoing basis. It's not just a set it and forget it. Yeah, that's great. And we do, Being the we are evaluating. So we'll go and get, take new photos or do whatever's necessary um, to make our clients successful. Yeah, that's fantastic. One of the things that Kyle and I always experience with our with our clients is they, they look at us as the experts and they look for advice and the education piece. So relying on your experience and the wealth of knowledge you've amassed over the past few years, I think would be very helpful, and especially in, in that type of uh, education and suggestion that you're able to provide if you're not seeing the type of activity that you'd like to see on your listing. It's great. And we provide this up front as well. So as we go through the furnishing and design, this is where we say, here's what we think would be ideal. And then you have those conversations then. And then we, we always mark it down, you know, what decisions were made and why. And then we can always revisit conversations afterwards. Perfect. Uh, we got a couple more. One very quick one. Uh, we, we see this in Toronto all the time with listings for rents and for sale. Many times people will list a den as a room. Um, how do you manage that? Is it listed as a two bedroom? You throw a bed in there. Like what, what's the, uh, what's the situation with something specific? Like if that? it is a condo, um, it does not need to have a window. Um, so that can still be a bedroom. Yeah, so that's where it differs. Maybe if we're looking at a resale, there's certain requirements that you need to list it as a bedroom. That's why I'd say a one bedroom and den as a short term rental, you extract a lot of value from that den. Whereas someone who buys it for personal use might, hey, oh, maybe I'll put a desk there, maybe I'll use it for whatever, you know, for maybe don't get as much value. Whereas this is where we come in and say we can monetize that space. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely do that. Now, of course, we always anchor back to well, competitiveness, but also guest experience. So you know if you're going to cram someone in a room and they're probably going to hate it, well, we probably won't advise that you do it because negative reviews will only diminish what you can earn. And the more you get, the more your your, your revenue potential goes down. So it's always looking ahead. And you, just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean we always do. One of my clients has done this in Calgary already. So <laughs> it can't be an option. Yeah. Situation. Oh, we we move doors and put in barn doors. You know, you get creative. That's exactly what we did. <laughs> exactly. So that's too. You can see it on our TikTok. <laughs> but that's why that's why you have people like us who then are able to provide that advice and say, if you do this, here's what you can have. Boom, light bulbs off. Okay, now the investment makes sense, but maybe it previously didn't. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, I don't think there's any more questions. Uh, thank you so much, Duncan and Beth and Nish. Thank you for joining. I think we had a really good session, an amazing amount of information coming out, dispelling a lot of the myths and rumors and getting a lot of fact 
about short-term rentals in Calgary. So thank you so much for attending and, and um, being a part of this. We had was, one question uh, pop up. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. Sure. It's a good one. Um, the client wants to know where they can find properties that you've staged for short-term rentals. Where can they see examples of that on your website or do you have any other uh, suggestions? Can reach out and I can send them some. Yeah, we, yeah. we can also send you, yeah, we have our company. I think we can send you our company information and it has a lot of um, our- We've got uh, a furnishing list. We can share previous design plans. Yeah, we can send our Airbnb link. And again, we don't hide behind anything. We're very transparent. So we're not trying to say that, you know, we don't manage these properties. We'll send the link, click on the link and you can see all the properties. Now there's some of the newer ones, you'll start to see some of our newer design as well. Keep in mind, some people come with furnished places or want to do it themselves, so they're not all our. Yeah, finishing. they're not all your key design in, in stage. Some people do come with whatever, and we say, we make, again, we provide advice. They say, no, I love this. I like the antique look. Great, I'll roll with the antique look if that's what you really want. But um, yeah, we, we do provide that. Like we do provide those design services free of charge as well, and uh, we can provide our Airbnb link. Awesome. Excellent. And all of that contact information and links will be provided in the email that we're going to send out to everyone after this session, including a recording of the webinar as well. So if you have any questions, get in touch with Nish or myself or for the Airbnbs, Duncan Betts information will be included there as well. Thank you guys so much. This was fun. It was a pleasure. Again, our doors open, our phones are open. So feel free to reach out anytime. Awesome. Yeah, very Thank informative. You so Thank you so much. Very useful all right. information. All right. Have a great day. Bye, guys. Thanks, you too. Take care. You both as well. Take care. Bye, everyone. Okay.